Okay, so uh, we have three lectures left in the semester, including today. And I'd like to use them to address some issues that we have not yet discussed. Um, these will be models of strain hardening. Uh, it will expand also on the notion of viscoplasticity that we briefly touched on in the course so far. And then uh, models of crystal plasticity and further ideas about strain hardening in that context. So let's uh, talk about strain hardening. Um, remember the models we've been considering so far are essentially elastic, perfectly plastic. So remember that, uh, just to recap, we can have plastic flow, which means the G tensor can evolve, its time derivative can be non-zero, when the yield condition is satisfied. In the, in the case, for example, of the von Mises condition for isotropy, that yield condition looks like this, deviatoric S, second pillar Kirchhoff referred to the intermediate state, K is the yield stress and shear. So for example, for a stress state like this, on an orthonormal basis of vectors A and B, then the yield condition is satisfied when absolute S is equal to K. So that gives you a physical interpretation. So the response say, if you plot S versus some measure of the amount of shear, let's say, then the model looks like this, elasticity, and then we saturate to a fixed value called K, the yield stress and shear, which we've thus far taken to be constant, a property of the material. And that's a, a good idealization for a number of metals. For example, mild steel comes to mind, um, but not all metals by any means. There's also a phenomenon called strain hardening, which is that the yield stress in shear actually evolves with plastic deformation post yield. Once plasticity begins to involve, evolve, G dot non zero the yield stress itself can evolve as well so that we have this hardening effect. So we can think of K itself is changing with, with the evolving plastic deformation. And there are various classical phenomenological models of this effect, um, which I, I'll, I'll describe. Um, the simplest ones first, uh, these are, I'll call them classical models because these go back uh, many decades and you can find actually a very good discussion of this of these in the book by Hill, which is quite old by now, it's 1950, 70 years old, but still a, an authoritative source. Um, the, the model I'll talk about is called, at first is called isotropic hardening, which is a bit of a, an unfortunate uh, terminology because it has nothing to do with isotropy of the material. Rather, it has to do with the kind of isotropic expansion of the yield surface as observed in stress space. So in this, in this model, K is some function of a parameter, we'll call it sigma. And sigma evolves with plastic deformation in some manner. So the two main classical models are these. Um, sigma evolves sigma dot is the norm of g dot g inverse. g dot g inverse, remember, is given by the flow rule, right? I don't have it written down, but you remember what it is. <laughs> and then sigma is the time integral of this over some, from some initial time to some, to the time of current interest. Uh, and so this uh, sigma is always increasing. The idea is to have a measure of uh, the, this parameter sigma that describes the, the work hardening to be always increasing in terms of the plastic deformation so that the more plastic deformation, the more hardening you have. Okay. First of all, we take K to be an increasing function of sigma and sigma itself to be an increasing function of, the, of some aspect of the plastic deformation. So this is one of the classical proposals the model of strain hardening. K of sigma itself has to be determined empirically, this function, okay? 
Another classical model uh, is based on the idea of plastic work or dissipation. Uh, you remember for small elastic strain, S dot G dot G inverse is proportional to the dissipation in the material of the material due to plasticity. And um, the dissipation was always by our, our early hypothesis, always positive whenever the plastic evolution G dot is non-zero. So this is, we could, we could imagine a parameter sigma evolving according to this expression. So integrated on time, G dot G inverse, because this is positive in the phys physically feasible case, because it's proportional to dissipation, we can replace it by its absolute value. So this is an absolute value here, whereas this of course is a norm of the tensor. And so both choices of sigma, and there may be many others, reflect the history of the plastic flow, right? <clears throat> and we assume that K, the yield stress in shear in this case, in, is an increasing function of this parameter sigma. Uh, uh, the book by Hill, which I've just mentioned uh, around page 30, describes the manner in which K of sigma can be determined experimentally in simple, for example, tension tests or torsion tests. And I'll refer you to that dis discussion. Uh, so the missing link here in the, in the today is how do we determine K of sigma empirically? I'll simply refer you to Hill for that, for that discussion. Although Hill is using a more a sort of outmoded notion of plasticity, but the same qualitative discussion applies. Here. Okay, so this sigma is becomes then essentially a constitutive parameter. It appears in a constitutive function, which is our our, our flow, our, our yield function. Right, k is now a function of sigma, so it takes on a, a significance as a constitutive function. In our framework here, we we laid down some restrictions that any constitutive function should satisfy. That is to say, one of them being the constitutive function should reflect the intrinsic properties of the material as reflected in this, this uh, intermediate state that we discussed a long time ago. And therefore, in particular, should be independent of our particular choice of the reference configuration that we use for us, the sake of our own convenience. The reference configuration is in principle a matter of choice and that choice should not affect the intrinsic properties of the material. Right? <clears throat> That's clearly the case for both of these definitions of sigma. These have nothing to do with it with the reference configuration. <clears throat> They're also clearly unaffected by superposed rigid body motions because as we've seen some time ago that property is shared by G and hence G dot and also S. And just from the definitions, uh, sigma is invariant under time translations where A is a constant, just a, a constant shift in the time measure. And these latter conditions, the latter two conditions then ensure that sigma obtained by integrating these equations is automatically frame invariant. So if we take K to be a function of sigma, then we don't disturb the frame invariance of the yield function. So that's essential. Okay. Um, if you look at the definitions of sigma dot here, the, and again, I, do, I want to emphasize, these are the two classical proposals that people have used and they've sort of stood, stood the test of time either out of indifference or laziness or I don't know what, or is simply that they're empirically rather good. And so people have stuck with them over, over the decades. <clears throat> um, it's, either choice of sigma is also invariant under material symmetry transformations. Remember under a material symmetry transformation, uh, the constitutive functions, if you go back in your notes, are insensitive to the replacement of K, the inverse plastic deformation, with KR, where R is any element of the symmetry group based on the intermediate configuration, 
And as we stipulated before, that's contained in the orthogonal group associated, for example, with a perfect crystal lattice. And also we've shown before that S transforms this way under material tra symmetry transformations. So, and that's important for the second choice of sigma here, which involves S. If you look at either definition of sigma, then the R factor in the, in the symmetry group is going to disappear because the, the norm here is insensitive to R. The norm is, think of it as a, as a function that's insensitive to uh, orthogonal transformations. Likewise, this is insensitive to R. And that's true for any kind of material symmetry, including crystalline symmetry. So that's that those those uh, classical notions of hardening, even though they were originally conceived for isotropic materials, in fact, they're appropriate for any kind of symmetry, not only isotropy, because R does not have to be, we're not confining attention to arbitrary rotations here, we're just confining attention to R's that, that are orthogonal. Uh, and the, 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 the material can then be crystalline, for example, and these definitions of sigma dot, both definitions remain invariant then under symmetry transformation. So uh, to belabor this further, then just to, to recap, both models of hardening are appropriate for any kind of material symmetry. So they don't be deceived by the, the, the terminology isotropic hardening. It has nothing to do with isotropy of the material. A further and maybe most important feature is that these definitions of sigma or the sigma dot are invariant under changes in the time scale. So they're invariant if you replace t by a positive constant times t, then both definitions of sigma dot remain invariant under that replacement. So both definition, both models of hardening are insensitive to whether you speed up the clock or slow it down, provided you don't reverse the sense of time, of course. So in this sense, they are rate independent models of hardening. They're insensitive to the rate at which the process, the, the, the G dot, the, the, the plastic evolution occurs. We'll revisit that idea later when we talk about again, viscoplasticity. So here's, here's the meaning of the term isotropic hardening in this context. For example, in the thing with the von Mises condition, if you look at the space of deviatoric tensors, it's five dimensional, five dimensional space of symmetric deviatoric tensors that, so we were in six dimensional stress space, S space, take a, a cross section of that, with uh, uh, orthogonal to the normal, which is the space of spherical tensors. And you have what looks like a circle or a hypercircle in five dimensions of radius norm dev s, right? Like we had before. And that radius according to the yield condition is square root of two times k. k can evolve with sigma. So, as sigma changes, say, so here's a, a value sigma, sigma naught, we have a certain radius of the yield surface. As sigma evolves, sigma is always increasing with plastic deformation according to the way we've defined it. Then the yield surface expands, doesn't change its shape, it simply expands. And that's, so it expands, we think of that as an isotropic expansion of the yield surface. Okay. So either model one or two yields the same kind of notion. Okay, so here we have then a model that accounts in some way for strain hardening. It's by no means the most general model of strain hardening. We'll, we'll generalize it uh, later, maybe beginning today, but certainly next, uh, next week. and for, for, iso for isotropic materials. And here's the flow rule for isotropic materials. You recall that we were, we argued we, we could suppress the plastic spin and that we, that's what we've done here. 
You cannot do that for crystalline materials. And lambda is some function of position and time to be determined in the course of solving a problem. And it must be non-negative to uh, ensure that uh, we have a physically admissible, admissible process. To, interestingly, now with hardening, with hardening taken into account, we can actually determine lambda. If you remember before, we really couldn't say anything specific about lambda. We had to determine it in the course of solving a problem directly as an additional variable. Um, here we can actually say more about lambda a priori. Let's uh, consider the following. Let's assume, well, if we have g dot non-zero at some instant in time, then there must be an interval of time during which plastic evolution evolves, right? If g dot is a continuum, so you focus attention on a particular x. So we only have to concern ourselves with the time evolution of g. If g dot is not zero at one instant in time, then there must, and, and if g dot is a continuous function of time, then there must be an interval of time during which g dot is non-zero, just by continuity. So that means there's an interval of time during which the material is yielded, which is to say the yield function is identically satisfied, identically zero in this time interval, whatever it is. And the yield function now depends on S as before and this hardening parameter sigma via this K. And this is then identically zero in the time interval, which means we can differentiate it in that time interval and the result must be identically zero. And we can use the chain rule to express this time derivative in terms of S dot and sigma dot. This, this expression here is called the consistency condition. In other words, this is consistent with the notion that yield persists, persists in an interval of time. <clears throat> um, so let's see, for the, the Mises case, the FDS we know is deb S, we've done that many times. The FD sigma, well, F depends on sigma through K, so it's minus two K, the K D sigma, and then we have the sigma dot here. Sigma dot, according to say the first model of sigma, the evolution of sigma, sigma dot was norm G dot G inverse. I'm just going to go through the details for that first model of isotropic hardening. I'll leave it to you to study the second alternative. It proceeds in a similar manner. Sigma dot involved is then norm G dot G, G inverse according to the first model. G dot G inverse, however, is lambda DFDS, right? When you take the norm of this, you get absolute lambda times norm DFDS. But absolute lambda is equal to lambda by virtue of the fact that lambda is non-negative. So we just get lambda norm DFDS here. And in our isotropic model, von Mises model, that's the norm of deb S. So we can then solve this for lambda under the assumption that K prime, the KD sigma is non-zero, in fact, positive. And we just get this, right? Deb S inner product deb S dot. By the way, the intermediate step here is the FDS is deb S inner product S dot, but this inner product only picks up the deb of s dot, right? Because of the orthogonality of the deviatoric and spherical tensors. And this then is applicable provided this deb s inner product deb s dot is non negative, right? To ensure that lambda is in fact non negative. So this makes sense provided this is true. This condition is called plastic loading or just loading and encompasses the, the equality is called neutral loading. Neutral loading gives you a zero value of lambda and hence a zero value of G dot according to the flow rule. <clears throat> 
So the neutral loading simply means you're 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 skimming the your, your tangential to the uh, yield surface, in the sense that deb s dot is orthogonal to deb s, which you, which you can think of as a, the position vector in deviatoric stress space, and that's a circle according to von Mises. So deb s dot should form an, an acute angle with deb s to ensure lambda non-negative. Right? And of course, simultaneously, def as itself must be on the yield surface. So it must satisfy this at the current value of sigma. At def s dot, if then you can see from this diagram, at, at the next time increment, let's say, def s will be, have a, have a larger uh, norm. So the radius will have expanded according to the increase in the value of sigma. Okay. So, uh, and alternatively, if this inequality is violated, that would give a negative value of lambda, which is inadmissible. So we'd replace lambda by zero, and then g dot would be zero. There'd be no plastic evolution. That would mean an increment in deb s that, ten, uh, that results in a value of deb s that's in, inside the current yield surface. And we would have no plastic evolution taking place in that case. Okay. So we can now write lambda in terms of the rate of change of s, and then ultimately then g dot in terms of the rate of change of s from the flow rule. Okay. In this case then is called unlo unloading. You unload from a state of yield. And that's analogous to our original discussion at the beginning of the course about what happens in a uniaxial tension test. When you unload elastically, you send, essentially, you don't change the plastic deformation. Let's see if we can extend the idea for any material symmetry. We indicated already that these definitions of sigma make sense for any kind of material symmetry, not just isotropy. So the literature can get confusing because these models were introduced in the context of isotropic materials. And that was in the bad old days when people had a tenuous understanding of material symmetry. We can improve on that these days. So for any material symmetry, of course, we have a yield function that again depends on S and sigma, according to our models one and two that we introduced for sigma. And the general flow rule, again, for small elastic strain, which we're, we're retaining that assumption, the general flow rule, if you go back in your notes, involves a plastic spin, omega, skew tensor. Lambda, again, has to be non-negative. Now, we would need a, an additional constitutive prescription for the plastic spin. And sometime uh, next week, I'll, I'll send you a paper in which an explicit constitutive formula is proposed, say, for cubic crystals. Okay. Um, if you go back way back in the notes, page 81, you recall the assumption that we can have dissipation. Well, we made a, a hypothesis that the dissipation is strictly positive if and only if g dot is non-zero. Okay. It's always non-negative, but we assumed any plastic evolution at all is a strictly dissipative process in the same way that frictional sliding is a strictly dissipative process. Right? Um, <clears throat> we also showed, if you look back when we're talking about flow rules on page 99, that plastic evolution is associated with S inner product symmetric part G dot G inverse strictly positive. Again, that was appropriate in the case of small elastic strain. We used that hypothesis of small elastic strain, remember, to approximate the Eshelby tensor by minus S. Okay. And so we've, if 
that you've no doubt forgotten that discussion, but at least you know where to look for it. If you look at the flow rule, take the symmetric part, you just get lambda dfds, and this inner product then has to be strictly positive with the lambda there whenever there's plastic evolution. Now, lambda can never be negative. So to have g dot non-zero, which means this combination has to be strictly positive, the only choice is to have lambda strictly positive, because if it were negative, this, or sorry, if it were zero, this equation star, inequality star would be violated. So with lambda strictly positive, we can always divide our plastic spin tensor by it to, to generate a new plastic spin scaled by lambda, call it lambda, uh, omega bar, okay? And that allows us to factor out the lambda on the right-hand side of the flow rule so that we can use the, we can imitate the previous discussion that we had for isotropy to try to determine lambda. So at this stage, we would again need a constitutive prescription for this omega bar, and that's a separate issue, separate discussion. So we, again, we have a consistency condition written here, say for the first model of hardening, that would be sigma dot is norm g dot g inverse. Take the norm of this, you get absolute lambda, which is lambda itself, times the norm of this sum, but this is the sum of a symmetric tensor and a skew tensor, and those live in orthogonal spaces. So by an extension of the Pythagorean theorem, the norm of this sum is just the square root of the norm of this squared plus the norm of that squared, okay? So then let's assume that dfd sigma is strictly negative as in the von Mises condition, so that the FD sigma is minus its absolute value, then you can solve for lambda in a similar manner to what we had before. That calculation this time will involve the plastic spin and the FDS inner product S dot. So this will be valid provided S satisfies the current yield function associated with the current value of sigma. And moreover, this inner product is non-negative to ensure that lambda is non-negative. And this then is called the, the loading or plastic loading condition in the case of a strict inequality or neutral loading in the case of equality here. For neutral loading, you again get lambda equals zero and hence G dot equals zero. So that's the, again depicted here where you could have a more a, a general shaped yield surface in the case of an anisotropic material, crystalline material, for example. And the yield function, according to this model for hardening that we've just discussed, entails, again, just a, an expansion of the radius at any given point by a value that depends on sigma. So the shape of the yield surface is preserved. It's just expanding as plastic evolution continues. Uh, the alternative is called unloading. In which case you have, you would replace the inadmissible negative value of lambda that you would get from here by the value zero. And that means no plastic evolution as before. Okay. So by the way, um, as far as I know, this extension of these isotropic, so-called isotropic Harding models to the anisotropic case, as far as I know, you won't find it in the literature. So this seems to be something new. The reason we can get away with it is because, in the case of a non-isotropic material, is because these models of so-called isotropic hardening have nothing to do with, they're valid for any type of material symmetry, not just isotropic materials, okay? So you're unlikely to find, say, a plastic spin in the literature here. Nevertheless, the same logic applies. And those are the classic models of strain hardening. Again, it's an empirical matter to determine the manner in which F depends on sigma for either of the two uh, models for prescribing sigma dot, right? Based on the norm of G dot G inverse or the, the dissipation. 
Okay. Um, if you go back to this inequality star, I just want to think about it for a moment. Where is it? There it is. We have this restriction. Plastic evolution requires lambda positive. S, the FDS, however, is a function all by itself, a, a, a yield function that you can write down by hand. And, and, and it, you know, it doesn't depend on whether plastic evolution is taking place or not. This restriction would then require that S inner product the FDS should be strictly positive in order to guarantee that what we've just described, in fact, um, is applicable. <clears throat> So this constitutes an a priori, a priori restriction on the yield function. <coughs> we can trivially verify that it's satisfied for a von Mises condition, but for an anisotropic material, such as what you have in homework, you have a crystalline material I'm asking you to look at. This is a restriction that you'd have to impose on that function to ensure that it, you get a physically realistic theory of plasticity. So by the way, I don't think I asked you to do this in your homework, but it would be a useful exercise for you to augment your homework by imposing this condition on your yield function. And that will impose some restrictions on the constants that appear in the yield function. In the case of a quadratic yield function, let's say. Um, we could retain our assumption, of course, that the yield function depends on stress through its deviatoric part for metals, yield is very nearly in, insensitive to pressure, right? Over a very wide range of pressures, according to Bridgman's experiments. Um, <clears throat> just to, to save some writing, I'll, I'll write dev S as S bar. So DFDS then, according to this assumption, this is the assumption we had at the beginning, we're just now adjusting it to accommodate sigma. The FDS inner product F, F, S dot would be F tilde dot, which would be the derivative of F tilde with respect to deviatoric S inner product dev S all dot. Dev S all dot is the dev of S dot. This inner product only picks up the deviatoric part of the first factor, right? And this inner product only picks up you, you could replace dev s dot by just s dot because the spherical part of s dot gets annihilated by the first factor. So you can now compare the left and the right to conclude that the FDS is the deviatoric part of the F tilde, the S bar. In other words, we don't know a priori that just because F depends on deviatoric S, that, that means its derivative is also deviatoric. But this tells you that the FDS is in fact, whether or not this parenthesis is deviatoric, it's the deviatoric part of the result that matters in DFDS. So this is, result is obviously then deviatoric. <clears throat> and in the von Mises case, this is trivial. For example, in the von Mises case, F tilde is just this, as we've seen. And we know that the derivative of this with respect to dev s is just dev s itself. And that's, so this is already deviatoric and sent, hence equal to its deviatoric part. And this, this however, was dfds. So this, according to this, this is dfds. So this, the, the, the Mises uh, criterion, which we've been using all along, certainly conforms to this operation. But still, it's, you know, it's, it's useful in extending the Mises condition to other types of symmetry besides um, isotropy, isotropy. Okay, so we still have to enforce this inequality that we just mentioned, this one at the top. To do that, let's fix sigma in the yield function. That defines another function of deviatoric S associated with that fixed value of sigma. Okay. Well, remember, we were looking at small elastic strain. Therefore, because of the invertibility of the S elastic strain relation, we're looking at basically small values of S as well. We're, we're approximating our yield functions by quadratic functions of S for that reason. 
So that suggests a Taylor expansion of this function about zero. We have a linear part and a quadratic part and then higher order terms that we intend to neglect. In the case of isotropy, for example, we found that the linear part was zero. This, this derivative here was just the identity and then this was the trace of deviatoric S which was zero. You'll, you'll find that that's also the case for cubic symmetry in your homework, that this derivative at s equals zero is also zero. <clears throat> in other words, the linear part would be zero in the case of cubic symmetry as well. And then the leading order part is quadratic, just as it was in the case of the Lamaisi's condition. <clears throat> so in the quadratic case, we would neglect these high order terms. If this inequality then is just the same as dfds is deviatoric. The deviatoric part of this, which and the AM product only picks up the deviatoric part of s then, and I'm calling s bar. And so we can drop the deviatoric qualifiers because uh, the, both tensors live in the set of deviatoric, in the space of deviatoric tensors. And the F tilde, the S bar at fixed sigma, this partial derivative with respect to S at fixed sigma, of course, is then dH dS. dH dS would just be HSS evaluated at zero S operating on S bar. And then a further inner product of S just gives you this, right? Which means the coefficients in the, deviate, in the quadratic term here, is a, that's positive definite according to this inequality. So this is a positive definite fourth order tensor, a positive definite on the space of deviatoric tensors. And that's simple to see in the case, for, for example, of von Mises, this quadratic part is just, we had a half, but that's already accounted for here. That's just the squared norm of deviatoric S, which is a positive definite function on the space of deviatoric tensors, right? Okay. So that's a condition that I would ask you to look at in your homework, even though I didn't ask you in, in writing. Okay. I'll come back to more modern models of strain hardening next week. But in the meantime, another issue, uh, a sort of miscellaneous topic that I'd like to revisit is the notion of viscoplasticity. And we've only had a very brief and elementary introduction to that subject in terms of the so-called Bingham model for rigid viscoplastic materials. If you recall, we've had some homework about that. So in that model, we're neglecting elastic strain so that H is a rotation everywhere. And, and we had this model where eta is a positive viscosity, just a constant. And when that's zero, we have the model we've been discussing where this, this term here was just our lambda. And we determine it, but this is, we can determine it in the case of, uh, you know, the, um, perfect plasticity where we have no hardening in terms of D. So look back in your notes for that. So this is the constitutive equation we had for viscoplasticity and it's operative provided norm tau deviatoric Cauchy stress exceeds root two K, the yield stress and shear. In other words, our typical, our, our yield condition is, is violated, right? It's not that F of tau is less than or equal to zero as required before, it's f of tau actually has to be greater than or equal to zero for this constitutive to, uh, function to be applicable. Uh, and this does not apply when tau is inside the yield surface, norm, norm tau. Again, this is the von Mises yield criterion applied to the case of rigid plastic or rigid viscoplastic response. So we had that discussion previously. We'd like, we, we don't want to leave it there because in general we have 
elastic and plastic deformation is taking place. And we'd like a theory that accommodates that possibility. This introduction to viscoplasticity was overly special in the sense that we neglected elastic strain in that discussion. So we want to allow for elastic plastic deformations and derive an appropriate flow rule for the plastic evolution. Here, the flow rule is for D, right? So we'd, to get the flow rule here, we'd have to invert this equation one to get D. We'd like to do that and then extend the idea to G dot G inverse in the presence of elastic strain. First thing to notice, by the way, is that when the viscosity tends to zero, this model reverts to this model, D equal lambda tau, where lambda is norm D over root 2K. That's, oper that's operative when norm tau is root 2K, right? We use this in, in order to derive this lambda. Notice that this, this expression is independent of the rate or the magnitude of D. The magnitude of D gives you the information about the rate at which deformation is proceeding, right? The larger that magnitude, the faster the deformation is taking place. Um, because D is the symmetric part of a velocity gradient, right? <clears throat> um, when eta goes to zero, you get this, lambda involves norm D. So you have D on both sides of the equation and the magnitude of D then is, does not affect this equation. So in that sense, this model is rate independent, okay? And those previous hardening models that we just talked about are also have that feature of rate independence. They're insensitive to the time scale, in other words replace C by a constant times, a positive constant times T, change the time scale, and this doesn't change. So this is, you can think of this as a rate independent model of plasticity. That's valid if there's negligible viscosity, even if you have a high rate, a high magnitude of D, a high norm of D, right? If there's no viscosity in material, then so be it, then this, this formula applies. You could then think that if this is the, a rate independent model associated with vanishing viscosity, then when you do have viscosity, you must have a sensitivity in the constitutive response to the rate of deformation. And that's also the case, that we'll see that's the case. Notice also that when norm D goes to zero, which means the rate of deformation is small, the deformation is proceeding slowly, when norm D goes to zero, this two eta times D term disappears in comparison to this because this is D over its norm. This D over its norm is insensitive to whether norm D is small or not, right? But when norm D goes to zero, this, this, this term disappears in comparison to this one, if you combine the terms. So this model that emerges is also the limit that you get when the rate of deformation is very small. So if you have a slow, an experiment in which the deformation proceeds slowly, then the viscoplastic model will revert to this rate independent standard model, okay? The rate independent limit, <clears throat> okay? So the viscoplastic model encompasses viscosity. It approaches the rate independent model when the viscosity is vanishingly small. And it also approaches the rate independent model when the rate of deformation is very small. Okay. Okay, if you look at equation one, then what I'd like to do to achieve the objective we have to get a flow rule for G dot G inverse, I wanna first look at what D looks like in this restricted rigid plastic model. To do that, I need to invert equation one. First order of business is to find norm D. If I can find the norm of D in terms of tau, then I can substitute in here and then just divide by this parenthesis and I have D. So let's do that first. 
um, from equation one, the norm of tau is two eta times this. This is non-negative, and hence, I mean, the norm would all normally pick up the absolute value of this parenthesis times norm d, but it's equal to its absolute value because it's non-negative. That's two eta norm d plus root two k. Norms drop out. So we can play around with this and solve for d. Um, I guess I'm dividing by a root two. And I get root two times viscosity times norm D is one over root two times, I'll call it G of tau times norm tau, where G of tau is defined here. Okay, scalar value function of tau. Um, <clears throat> notice that G of tau being not, non-negative is equivalent to the original yield function being non-negative in the sense that this means norm tau exceeds root 2k, which is the same as the condition that f of tau, the yield function is non-negative. So we could interchange, we could use g of tau interchangeably with the yield function. Okay, so then norm d we can immediately solve we get it in terms of tau and norm tau. And this is valid then. The whole model is operative when you're outside the yield surface. So it's true for G non-negative. It's G non-negative. Put that back in equation one. You have, now that you have norm D, you have this. And um, let's see, I can, I factored out the so this goes in the denominator, then I can factor out the two eta, and I have this. This again makes sense for G positive, right? otherwise the denominator doesn't work. <clears throat> and I can write that this way. Um, so I can then, with G positive and tau, such that G is positive, in other words, tau, norm tau is positive also then this parenthesis is positive and divide by it and get two eta times D is this. So, <clears throat> you know, from like say Navier-Stokes equations or Newtonian viscosity, two eta D is just tau, right? So classical fluid mechanics would just have this parenthesis equal to one. This is viscoplasticity, which is similar, but quite different. Okay, the, the main difference being that this equation only holds when G is positive. In other words, the material is sufficiently stressed <clears throat> to have yielded. Uh, if we look at this arrangement, let's clean this up a bit. G tau norm tau here in the denominator. Here's G of tau and another way of writing G of tau in this parenthesis. Multiply by norm tau, you just get this. So g tau plus root 2k is just norm tau. And then you can divide it numerator and denominator. And you just get 2a to d is g of tau times tau, provided that g is positive and is equal to zero when g is negative, because that means f is, sorry, is, is, uh, is negative. And here is g of tau again, okay? So this is the inversion of the viscoplastic, the classical Bingham viscoplastic model. And this substitutes for the flow rule. The, the standard flow rule was D is lambda times tau, right? This replaces that. You don't have a lambda anymore. You have something explicitly in terms of tau. Provided tau is such as to make G positive, okay? When G is equal to zero, then you're right on the yield function and you're in the transition to zero deformation in that case, right? There's no plastic evolution anymore. <clears throat> um, along the way, we might've noticed the following. Um, we had before two eta times norm D is G, of, G times tau, not G of tau, but G times norm tau, which is according to this norm tau minus root two K. So this says, <clears throat> 
the higher the rate of deformation, the larger norm tau. So we have a, a graph like this. So if you plot norm tau against some, against a measure of strain, which say the, the time integral of norm D would be a measure of strain, a kind of invariant measure of deviatoric strain because norm is D is deviatoric. <clears throat> you would have a, a curve that looks like this. By the way, this K should really be a root 2K if this is a, a, mis, a misprint. So please correct your notes to replace this K by root two times K. So when norm D tends to zero, that's a, the slow deformation process, norm tau approaches root 2K and you have this perfect plasticity. Norm tau saturates at new, root 2K. That's the perfectly plastic case, the rate independent limit. As norm D increases at a given strain, so you look at a given strain, you can't plot strain and strain rate simultaneously, but if you look at a sequence of plots of norm tau versus strain, take strain to be the time integral of norm D. If you look at a sequence of such graphs where the experiment was carried out at different values of norm D, then you would find this hardening effect, a rate sensitivity. The material effectively hardens due to increasing strain rate, according to this model. And that, in fact, is quite in accord with experimental observation. <clears throat> so you can have, of course, when eta is zero, you're just back with the uh, original rate independent model. So this gives you an, a physical way of understanding this model. Due to rate or increasing strain rate, the, the smallest norm D can be a zero, of course, and that gives you the rate, this, this limit. But if you increase the strain rate, then you have an apparent hardening of norm tau plotted against strain at a different values of strain rate. <clears throat> okay. Okay, um, we can rewrite things a bit if we want in terms of the yield function itself, which was a half norm tau squared minus k squared. In this function g, we have one over root two norm tau, which then is equal to root f plus k squared. Okay. <clears throat> and when f is zero, which is the smallest it can be, um, we have uh, tau is root 2k as before. So we can write g, rewrite it in terms of the yield function itself in this way. And then this is operative provided your stress state is outside the yield surface. And otherwise you have zero. So the only thing of interest about this function here is that it's actually a positive definite function of f when f is positive when f is non-negative, right? When f equals zero, you get zero, which matches this. When f is positive, this is strictly positive, right? The parenthesis is strictly positive. So it's a positive, you could think of this, you could write, in place of here, you could write what's called the Macaulay bracket of f, where the Macaulay bracket just picks up the f when f is positive. Right? So it's a positive definite function of f when f is non-negative. And that's, that's a clue to how we might generalize this. Well, for isotropy, we can immediately generalize, generalize to accommodate elastic plastic deformations. You remember d was just a rotated version of g dot g inverse, rotated by the elastic deformation, which was a pure rotation in the rigid plastic case. So we can immediately appropriate what we've done, replace tau by the FDS, we're working with S now and G dot G inverse in place of D. And here's our coefficient function and our yield function is before the von Mises function where K is the same constant. So this extends the viscoplastic model to accommodate, see we said nothing here about H anymore, this just 
gives you plastic evolution, which you can combine now with elasticity to give an elastic viscoplastic model. Okay. Okay. Okay, you might, the obvious question to ask next is, well, what about general material symmetry? Can we extend the notion of viscoplasticity to accommodate general material symmetry? Well, effectively what we've done is to replace, uh, we had here, g dot g inverse is lambda dfds. We've replaced lambda by one over two eta times this positive definite function of f, when f is non-negative. We could do the same thing here, just replace. See, there was no plastic spin in the isotropic case. We could do the same here, just to add in the plastic spin, right? So we're replacing lambda by one over two eta times some positive definite function of the yield function when the yield function is non-negative and zero otherwise. So that's one way to extend the model to accommodate anisotropic, anisotropic materials, crystalline materials. Again, you need a constitutive prescription for the plastic spin. That's another, another topic. Typically you would take plastic spin to depend on S itself, for example, right? That would be one reasonable constitutive assumption. Um, or we could do what we did before and factor out the lambda, right? We factored out a lambda and wrote omega as lambda omega bar. And if we're gonna replace lambda by one over two eta times this positive definite function of non-negative f, then we might as well do that here as well, right? Okay, so one way to, there are various ways to extend this to, to crystalline symmetry. And these, you know, have not really been well explored in the literature. There's not much literature on uh, this kind of viscoplastic model for crystalline symmetry. Um, so it's really, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of an open subject. So phi of f could, one way to extend the theory is to take this to be any positive definite function of f when f is, uh, is itself non-negative. Here's, here's one that we used in the case of isotropy. And a slightly odd thing is to have, you know, viscosity also controlling spin, right? We're not accustomed to that. When we talk about fluid mechanics, we know that we better not have the vorticity tensor, the skew part of the velocity gradient, appearing in the constitutive equation. That's because the skew part of the, of the spatial velocity gradient is not frame invariant. So if we had that in a constitutive function, it would, it would fail to satisfy frame invariance. That's why we don't have it in fluid mechanics. Here, however, everything here is frame invariant. G and g dot, remember, were frame invariant, invariant under superposed rigid motions. The same then is true of both of the symmetric and skew parts. So there's nothing wrong with having a spin here because it's, in this context, this is a frame invariant quantity. So these are just two proposals among many that could be conceived of, of viscoplastic uh, models for crystalline materials. And the, by far the most widely studied one is the isotropic model. Okay. Um, a, a feature of major significance though that we might touch on is, notice now that we have plastic evolution whenever F is non-negative. Before, when we were talking about finding lambda in the rate independent theory, we had to introduce so-called consistency condition which is that F is identically zero when there's yielding. Here, F can be anything non-negative when there's yielding. And there is no lambda in this theory, right? So lambda has been replaced by something that has a, a cons 
a clear constitutive, or, or at least a, a constitutive character. So there's no consistency condition to worry about because there's no lambda that we need to find. Um, and also, you know, numerically, uh, something I didn't discuss so far, if you integrate plasticity theory numerically, in the rate independent theory, you have to ensure that at all times in, in your, as the system evolves, you don't violate this inequality. Because in the rate independent theory, it's physically impossible to get outside the yield surface, even if the, the yield surface evolves, right, because of sigma, the hardening aspect, but you can never get outside the current yield surface, right? In a numerical approach to plasticity, you'd have to guarantee that that inequality is always satisfied as the numerical solution advances in time. And that's extremely difficult to do numerically. Um, and that, that fact has given rise to a, you know, a significant efforts to, to treat this problem from the numerical point of view. In the viscoplastic case, there's no such difficulty at all. You just check whether, you know, you say you have a predictor step when you predict, you integrate the flow rule, g dot, g inverse, assuming, say, plastic evolution. At the next step, you then update the system and you check whether or not this equality is satisfied or not. If it's not, you simply set g dot equal to zero for the next step. If it is, then you simply integrate the flow rule. You don't have to worry about maintaining this inequality. You either have this, either f is greater than or equal to zero, in which case you use a flow rule like this, or it's not, in which case you just, you don't integrate, there's no evolution of g. So in principle, viscoplasticity is a far easier alternative to rate independent plasticity from the, from the point of view of numerical analysis. And in fact, for many, many people, involved in numerical plasticity will simply use the viscoplastic model for this reason. Because ensuring that you remain inside the elastic range, that is you don't you don't have a state that somehow drifts outside the yield surface, that would be physically inadmissible in the rate independent theory, to, to ensure that numerically is an enormous headache. Okay. So I'm an advocate for using viscoplasticity as an alternative. First of all, viscoplasticity contains the rate independent theory as a special case. In the, for number one, in the limit of small viscosity, get back to the rate independent theory. Number two, in the limit of slow rate of deformation, or as in this case, a small norm of G dot G inverse, that would also get you back to the rate independent theory. So if we can avoid this great complication of ensuring this is always true, then why not? Okay, so that's a, a summary of some sort of, I would say, you know, uh, issues about plasticity in the, in, in the classical framework that we didn't discuss. And so I took, took this opportunity to, to provide some discussion about that. Next week, we'll uh, talk about this more recent topic, which is, well, I'll start it today, the topic of scale dependence. In fact, strain hardening is observed ex experimentally to be a scale dependent phenomenon, which is to say the size of the sample can influence the extent to which the material itself hardens or not. So I, I posted on B courses a couple of papers last night, yesterday. One by Hutchinson goes back 20 years. And another one by these two gentlemen goes back 22 years. This is an experimental paper and this is a kind of discussion paper on experimentally observed effects of how the strength of a material appears to increase as the sample size decreases, which is kind of extraordinary, right? We're not accustomed to that in continuum mechanics. You know, for example, you know, you measure a Young's modulus or a yield, a yield uh, stress, and and 
you have the idea that those values don't depend on the size of the sample, right? They're strictly material quantities, material properties. But in fact, it's observed experimentally that the yield stress, or which would be a measure of the strength of the, of the sample, in other words, the, the, that strength of the hardening effect, you can have an increase in hardening with decreasing sample size provided the sample is sufficiently small. I mean, there'd be a, a wide range of sample sizes over which you would not observe this effect, but when the sample gets very small, you know, in the order of microns, let's say, or when the, when the sample size start, starts to compete with the size of, of the crystal grains, let's say, in the material, then you observe the strengthening effect at the constitutive level. So evidently, there, the, the phenomenon of strain hardening is scale dependent. So if you've studied, uh, some of you I know are interested in strain gradient elasticity, for example, that's another scale dependent theory in which the, the response of the material depends somehow on its size, whereas classical continuum mechanics is scale independent, right? You can you you can scale up or you can scale a model up or down without changing its response suitably scaled. So in other words, you can you can build a building on the basis of what you built in the laboratory in a scale model, right? Because the response of the scale model will be the same as the response of the building. Uh, that's the premise of that is that the material is scale independent. Uh, strain gradient elasticity does not have that feature. It has a feature that the response of a sample depends in some significant way, qualitatively and quantitatively, on the size of the sample relative to other length scales in the problem. <clears throat> well, that's what we're talking about here. According to these gentlemen and their experiments, hardening of the material is actually scale dependent at least when you get down to really small length scales. And since about that time, since about the late 1990s or about 2000 or so, there's been a, a big literature emerging on the development of so-called strain gradient theories of plasticity, which is a bit of a misnomer, like much of plasticity is full of misnomers. Uh, but the idea of strain gradient theories of plasticity is that constitutive functions, for example, the yield function, are adjusted to allow for, say, a dependence on the gradient of plastic deformation or inverse plastic deformation. K itself, or equivalently G, the inverse of K, is dimensionless, right? Gradient of that would have dimensions of one over length. So if you put this in a constitutive function, it would be multiplied by a constant that has dimensions of length, let's say, in order to render everything dimensionally consistent. And this gradient would then compete with the length scale in the, in the function itself and manifest its, itself or make itself more and more apparent at smaller and smaller length scales. Okay, so if you have K changing significantly over a small length scale, this gradient would be large and its effect would be more and more pronounced in a constitutive function such as the yield function. So if the yield function, which contains information about hardening, were to depend on this, then you would have a scale dependent yield function. And that's the idea behind these so-called strain gradient theories of plasticity. It's an unfortunate term because this does not refer to the gradient of the actual strain in the material, which would involve the deformation gradient F, right, the gradient of F. It instead refers to the gradient of the plastic deformation. Okay. Alternatively, you know, we could have a dependence on grad G. So let's, let's have a look at constitutive functions that could depend maybe on plastic deformation, maybe on gradient of plastic deformation, and so on. So, so let's have an examination of what's possible. What kind of functions can these be? 
Um, the first thing we're going to show, which is interesting and remarkable, is that to be admissible as a constitutive function, and remember what that means, it, sh it should reflect the intrinsic properties of the material, and hence not be sensitive to our idiosyncratic choice or reference configuration. So to qualify in that sense, it turns out that so a constitutive function like this that depends on, say, G and its gradient must depend on that combination through the dislocation density that we had a long time ago on page 71 of the notes. Remember, the dislocation density was defined this way in terms of G, K, this that K, which is the inverse of G. Okay. So it's kind of remarkable that here our dislocation density comes back uh, into the discussion in the context of scale dependent constitutive functions. Okay. Um, either way, so, so I wanna, there, there's another, another useful paper here and I'm going to follow this one in the remainder of this discussion, which we'll have to continue into next week. Chermelli and Gerton, 2001, which I posted on B courses. A very important paper uh, in the recent literature on plasticity, actually. So you can't have any old constitutive function that's constitutively admissible. It, grad G has to occur in the combination alpha the dislocation density. So what I mean by constitutive admissibility is the requirement that the constitutive function should, again, reflect the intrinsic properties of the material via this natural state that we introduced, kappa i, intermediate state, which has some physical significance for the material. It's the crystalline structure that we would see in a stress-free state, right? That's how we introduced it before. So it, 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 it contains information then about the material properties that are intrinsic to the material in sharp contrast to a reference configuration, which is just something we choose to make our lives easy for the sake of analysis. So this function should be insensitive to the choice of reference configuration. So what I'm going to do is introduce a map from, say you have two reference configurations and a map from one to the other and we're going to choose that map. We're going to we could make arbitrary choices of that map to get one reference configuration or another one and see what the implications are for the constitutive function. Uh, before we proceed, we'll have to pretty much stop here today, but notice that frame invariance is automatic because G and grad G, G and its gradient, referential gradient are automatically frame invariant. We found the same for alpha back back way back in the notes, automatically frame invariant. So we don't have to worry about frame invariance. We can also see that equation star is a sufficient condition for this basic requirement to be satisfied. That namely that F should be insensitive to the choice of reference configuration. Why? Because alpha had that property. If you look back in your notes, I think it's on page 71, yeah, of the notes. Alpha had the remarkable property of being insensitive to the choice of reference configuration and consequent, and also incidentally insensitive to superposed rigid motion superposed on the current configuration. So this is a sufficient condition for our basic requirement to be met. Question, which arises, which is more difficult to answer, is, is it also a necessary condition? In other words, must constitutive functions that depend on G and grad G, must they appear, must they depend on that, on this combination alpha? Must, they, must these variables appear in the combination alpha? Is it necessary that they do? And I think, uh, we should stop here because uh, the rest of the discussion is a bit technical. You can read about it over the long weekend and we'll discuss it uh, when we resume uh, next Tuesday. Okay, so the rest of this particular lecture is to show the necessity of that result. And then we'll 
we will augment our yield function, for example, to depend on alpha, the dislocation density. Okay, and that will give us a scale dependent model of strain hardening. Okay, so let's uh, stop the lecture here for now. And if you have questions, please ask them. Otherwise, we'll, I'll see you. Um, I, I'll hold another office hour tomorrow night to make up for missing yesterday, okay? Um, so first, can I ask you a question about yeah. this? Yeah. Um, what exactly is the inspiration that your surface of failure is going to be associated with the dislocation density? Well, um, the, the idea that there's a the, the, the yield, the hardening of the material, and therefore, the, which is reflected in the yield function, yeah. yeah, itself depends on the scale, at yeah. least for the sample sizes that are sufficiently small, it's yeah. scale dependent. One way of getting scale dependence into the theory is through the gradient of plastic deformation. Yeah. There also, there's, I'll post another paper, a reference to it, uh, old paper by G.I. Taylor, which showed, he did some sort of hand calculations showing how the yield, fun, the yield stress should depend on dislocation density also. Yeah. Yeah, because you have that, you have the gradient and mm -hmm. I can understand that the dislocation density depends on the curl. Both yeah. are derivatives with respect to spatial coordinates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the same, the same order, right? They're, for, they're both yeah. first order spatial yeah. derivatives, yeah. Yeah, because from a mechanical, from a material science point of view, I can comprehend that if you have a smaller specimen and you start generating dislocation motion because it is confined in a much smaller space, the dislocations get impeded, and therefore yeah. you can they, 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 yeah. they form an obstacle to plastic yeah. slip, to, to yeah. crystallographic slip, right? That's, and, that's the main mechanism, the so-called dislocation pile-up or dislocation obstacles. Yeah. The, this dislocations themselves impede yeah. plastic flow, make it more difficult to cross plastic flow, and thereby the material hardens, strain hardens. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. see. That, that's, a, that's actually a... Okay. A good way to understand it. Yes. I see. Yeah. Okay. If uh, any of your questions, if not, happy Thanksgiving, and I'll uh, see you uh, office hours tomorrow night, and also next Tuesday, or next Monday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>